Now on Zero Block 30, we are joined by two lovely guests, Ryan Mannion and Tim Sullivan from the Travis Mannion Foundation. Welcome to Zero Block 30. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks yeah. for having us. So let's just get right into it chronologically. And we'll start with you, Tim. And we'll start on 9-11 because you wrote an op-ed that was very interesting. And it gave the story of where you were on 9-11 all the way up to where you are now. And and we'll we'll have Ryan jump in when when she came into the picture. But let's just start with nine eleven and, and where the origins of the Tim Sullivan experience with the Travis Manion Foundation started. Well, as um, you know, everybody has a story about nine eleven. Being mm-hmm. a New York City fireman, uh, a lot of people ask me, uh, "Where were you on nine eleven? What right. did you do on nine eleven?" Uh, so my story is, I was actually home. I was off duty. Um, it actually had been a beautiful day that morning mm-hmm. uh, my wife was eight and a half months pregnant and she was a school teacher so she had gotten up in the morning and she actually said hey Tim it's a beautiful day um, I'm going to work mm-hmm. <laughs> you're staying home mm-hmm. um, and with that I went downstairs I was reading the paper and uh, the phone rang and it was turned out to be my brother who is a Navy officer and he goes oh thank God you're home I yeah. said, what are you what are you talking about he goes aren't you watching TV I said, no, I'm, uh, I'm not. He goes, turn on the TV. So I turned on the TV, and the, the first tower was burning. And I said to him, holy, you know, it looks like the brothers are going to be busy today. Mm-hmm. And he just paused, and he said to me, Tim, it's going to get worse. You need to get to work. Mm-hmm. And with that, he hung up. Um, I went outside, jumped in the car, and I started driving into the city. And I said, well, I better call Colleen. And I called, and I left a message on, the, on her voicemail. I said, hey, look, something's going on in Manhattan. Uh, I got to get to work, and uh, I don't know when I'll get a chance to call you again. Um, As I drove into the city, um, I got to Yonkers Raceway, and if you know where that is, uh, you could actually see the skyline. I could actually see both towers burning. Mm -hmm. And I just got a bad feeling in my stomach. And what I did was I called uh, my friend Jeff, whom Colleen and I had already asked to be our unborn child's godfather. And he said, you're heading into the city? I said, yeah, I am. And he says, okay. I said, look, Jeff, firemen are going to die today. Um, If something happens to me, uh, you're going to have to watch over Colleen and uh, our unborn child. Was that a a thought you had ever had before going into work? I had only had it once before. Um, It was when I actually left to go to uh, Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, when I was a Marine. Mm -hmm. And I had asked a priest uh, who I knew that if something happened to me, um, I wanted him to say my funeral. Mm-hmm. Um, so I hadn't thought about it ever since. Mm-hmm. Um, but I asked Jeff, um, and I got into the firehouse, and you know, we all the guys coming in from off duty. It was it was crazy that day. You know, as I was driving in as fast as my little uh, Chevy Cavalier <laughs> could drive, I was actually being passed. I was doing 100 miles an hour, and I was being passed on the left and the right by Jeez. by other cops and firemen racing wow. into the wow. city. Yeah. Was, uh, so by the time I got down to the Trade Center, um, the s- both towers had come down already, mm-hmm. um, and it was, you know, you know, dust and smoke everywhere, and, you know, people you know, that had survived the collapse um, kind of walking around. And then the guys like us who were coming in, a- you know, after the fact, uh, we just tried to help them. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they, they do, do what we could, and we started forming small groups uh, under officers that we didn't know, and they were like, "Okay, this group, you know, start di- start digging here." And we'd form, you know, and we'd, you know, we would hear the on the air packs. Um, there's uh, motion sensors, mm-hmm. and if there's no motion, they go off. So we could hear motion sensors in in the piles of debris, and we try and dig, and and you know, we you know, it turned out to be just a pack laying on sure. the ground that maybe had been dropped or you know whatever. Um, so. I worked through the night, um, you know, at the trade center. Went home uh, the next morning. Um, saw you know, saw Colleen, and then what started was basically 24 hours on and about 12 hours off, mm-hmm. either at the trade center or in the firehouse um, for the next few days. And my next part of the story of 9/11 is that on the day the President Bush came to uh, the Trade Center, and mm-hmm. everybody remembers him standing yeah, there. with that the, great speech, yep. 
Uh, I was dog tired, and they said, if you're going to leave, leave now. Either that or you're going to be, you know, you're going to have to stay. Right. So I said, I'm out of here, and I headed home. And my wife, like I said, eight and a half months pregnant, absolutely has a meltdown on me. And she's screaming and yelling that, you know, how could you leave? You know, you were just willing to go. Mm -hmm. And she goes, you didn't even think about me. And I said, I did. I did think about you. She goes, what do you mean? How, how did you think about me? And I, I, I go, I, I called Jeff. And all of a sudden she stops crying and she looks at me. She goes, you called Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> you called Jeff, not me? Yeah. I said, what do you mean you called? I said, she goes, you left me with Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Jeff. So I said, I'm, so muffs, Jeff. I'm like, sorry. Uh, you know, Brad Pitt wasn't available. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah. how it went on. And then exactly two weeks after uh, September, exactly two weeks after September 11th, uh, my son was born. Mm -hmm. uh, his birthday was just... Uh, uh, the other, yes, you know, two days ago he yeah. turned 17. That's crazy. Um, so it's been, uh, you know, and that started a whole thing of, you know, working at the trade center, working in the firehouses, and then on off duty time, I would actually come home and take take my son Aiden in a little one of them, you know, baby Bajorn things, yeah. and strap him to the chest of my uniform, and I just take him to funerals, mm -hmm. um, you know, and just. And my wife would be like, which funeral are you going to today? I said, I don't know, the one, this one, I'm going to yeah. this, you know, I'm yeah. going to, uh, you know, this one, I'm going to that one, I'm going to Patty Brown's, I'm right. going to uh, Greg Sikorsky's, um, Chris Blackwell's, you know, and it was just, you know, it, whether it was guys I knew or guys I didn't know, but I went to as many as I could, to, you know, and I had a newborn strapped to my chest. Right? Yeah. Um, so life moved on, you know, yeah. the fire department moved on. Um I, a couple years after, um, I had been working up in Harlem, and I got the opportunity to be transfer to Rescue Company one, Number One in Midtown Manhattan. Right, mm -hmm. you got a visitor, and then yeah. and then I got a visitor. So Rescue One is a special ops company. Uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, scuba diving. We do a mm -hmm. lot of the um, technical rescue stuff that happens in in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And I was working on in December of two thousand six and there was a knock on the door and there's two marines at the door and you know i said hey come on in mm -hmm. um they said hey we're marines we're you know we're here visiting i said well i'm a former marine um you know come on in sure and you know usually in midtown manhattan a lot of firehouses get a lot of visitors mm -hmm. um and i kind of had my standard tour mm -hmm. that i would give you know visitors but uh him being a marine you know, both of them being Marines. Yeah. Um, you know, we started talking a little bit, and, uh, you know, it turns out Travis, you know, talked about having been to Iraq mm -hmm. and that he was getting ready to go back to another, you know, another deployment. Uh, he had a friend with him who was a, a helicopter pilot, CH-53 mm -hmm. pilot, mm -hmm. um, uh, Steve uh, Cantrell. Um, and we just talked, and he ended up hanging out for a couple hours in the yeah. firehouse uh, talking about the upcoming deployment and what he expected. Um, and at the end of the, after showing him around the firehouse and talking a bit, uh, Travis actually said, uh, you know, Hey, can I buy a t-shirt or a hat? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, you can't buy it. I said, I'm going to give it to you. Yeah. You know, so I gave him a, a t-shirt and a, and a hat. Mm -hmm. Um, and with that off into the night he went right. and you probably didn't think much of it at that I, point. To be honest, yeah. it was, yeah. it, that, that's what happened. And off into the night he went, um, and then Ryan, what was what was Travis's journey to, to that point? How did he end up in the Marines? Well, my dad is a uh, retired Marine Corps colonel, so mm -hmm. we were born into a military family, and um, but never was my dad pushing my brother to to serve in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. um, he actually ended up choosing to go to the the Naval Academy for college. Um, so we knew as soon as he um, left for college that he would be serving in the right. military in, in some capacity. And, and what year was it that he entered the Naval Academy? Um, 99. He graduated from high school. OK. So um, so 9-11 you know, happens while he's at the Naval Academy. Right. So he enters the Naval Academy. And again, you know, growing up in a military family, um, my dad never deployed during my entire life mm -hmm. growing up. I never had that sense of. Um, worry or fear while he was serving in the military. It actually wasn't until September 11th that all of a sudden I looked at, I was in college at the time too. Travis and I were 15 months apart. And um, I remember that morning I was asleep and I was woken up by my mom 
And my dad was still a reservist at the time, um, stationed at the Pentagon. And he was actually working for Johnson and Johnson and out on a service project. Um, and so my mom could not get a hold of him. So she calls me hysterical because she had just gotten a call from Travis who says, you know, mom, something's going on in New York. They've put the Naval Academy in lockdown mm -hmm. and they actually moved them off the Academy grounds. Right. Um, and so, you know, my mom's freaking out and I'm watching the TV and I don't know what to do with myself. So I'm like, I guess I'm just going to go to class. So I go to my English class that day and my teacher, I'll never forget, my professor says, listen, um, in light of what's happening, you know, and still at that, when I left for class, um, neither tower had collapsed, mm -hmm. but both had been hit and they knew it was a terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. You know, they were already saying that. So he said, pull out a piece of paper and a pen and, and just write down what you're feeling right now. And I actually just found that piece of paper just a couple years ago. And I had written on that piece of paper for the first time in my life, I'm scared of the fact that my dad is in the military and that my brother's going to be going into the military. And I had written, you know, I hope this, what hap what's happening today does not result in war and that um, my, my dad or brother will end up having to go into a war zone. And, you know, it, it, that's exactly what happened. Sure. But um, so he ended up at the Naval Academy and then again, chose the Marine Corps, not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, went, graduated in 2004 and did his first deployment to Iraq right away in 2005. And where was he in 2005? To Iraq, you said? I'm sorry? He was in Iraq, yeah. Okay, so, so I mean, things were, pretty, things were pretty heated in Iraq back in 2005. Yes. And then... Yeah. I, yeah. Then it was a tough time. Go in ahead, between... Sorry. No, no. In between those, that first deployment then, he came home from that deployment. And was he just on leave that he wound up going to New York City and just thought he'd he, visit? and. Yeah. He was on leave and he he had a very small window between when he got back to when he was going again because he had joined wow. actually a, a military transition team called a MIT team. Right. Mm -hmm. So he was got pulled uh, to join this MIT team, one of 12 other Marines that would be helping to train the Iraqi army. Mm -hmm. And so he was stationed in Pendleton out in California. So Travis was back from Pendleton and came back to the East Coast and he wanted to make sure that he did a, a few things. Mm -hmm. Um that was on his bucket list. I'm going to get up to New York. I want to make sure I spend some time with um, the firefighters in New York. And, you know, other things on his bucket list were I'm going to a Philadelphia Eagles game, <laughs> uh, Super Bowl champs. Go, Go birds! birds! <laughs> yeah. And uh, But those were, like, two of the main things that he wanted to do in that short window. So he, he took a trip up to New York. And, and you know, when he came back uh, from that trip to New York, he went to my dad. He actually went to my dad. And, 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 you know, it's interesting because Tim's recollection of that time was like, hey, it was another couple of people yep, that came. Another couple of guys. Yeah. And, but Travis came back like, hey, um, so amazing. We met this, the, the firefighters. This guy was a Marine. He fed us. He took care of us. Their operations are amazing. We got to thank him. Oh, by the way, dad look at this hat he gave me. And he mm -hmm. gave the hat to my dad. And on the back, the hat said, 9-11, um, never forget. Mm -hmm. And he said, dad, dad, hold on to this hat while, while I'm gone. And yeah. um, my dad had it hanging right in our gym uh, in, at, at my parents' house um, while, my while my brother was deployed. So. And then your brother deployed again. He deploys again the day after Christmas in 2006. Mm -hmm. And um, and then on April 29th, 2007, uh, we get a knock on our door that he has been killed by enemy sniper uh, while in Iraq. And, um, you know, it was, uh, I, I hope it will be the toughest day of our life. But um, it was, you know, it was a tragic day and one I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. And obviously you never want to forget his memory. So from that day forward, how did you develop the, the foundation? What, what, what were the steps in between that day and then the Travis Manning Foundation starting? You know, I, I often say, like, I think the Travis Manning Foundation was born the day that he passed. Because mm -hmm. I, I remember um, after the initial shock um, and just, like, not even be able to comprehend, like, oh, my gosh, he's gone. Um, it was the day of Travis's funeral. A few days later, my dad pulled my mom and I into their bedroom and he said, listen, you know, this is the toughest thing we're ever going to have to go through. And we've lost, 
you know, the rock of our family, but we have to continue to move forward and not only continue Travis's legacy, but the legacy of all these men and women who have given their lives mm -hmm. in service to this country. And so we made a commitment in that bedroom uh, before we stepped out to go to his funeral that we were going to do something. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, at, the, at the time in 2007, believe it or not, GoFundMe was not around. There were no um, online giving portals. Mm -hmm. right. And our parents' friends had actually gone down to the local bank and they set up a bank account. And in the newspaper, it said, you know, in lieu of donation or in lieu of flowers, please send donations to the first Lieutenant Travis Mannion Memorial Fund. Mm -hmm. And we found ourselves about three weeks after Travis's death, when we were kind of like picking up the pieces, what happens now? Um, we went down to the bank and we had several hundred thousand dollars. Wow. In the bank. wow. <laughs> and yeah. we were like, wow, okay, this is the start of it. And we just hit the ground running from there. And yeah. I think that's a testament to, uh, I've heard so many stories about him. It's a testament to who he was as mm -hmm. a person. And oh, absolutely. I was telling them I'm from uh, Chester County, then lived in Delaware County, but my last name's also Mannion. Um, I have oh I have an extra N. But when I was in the Marine Corps, several times people came up to me. I was in from 2008 to 2012, but several times Marines came up to me and said, "Did you know? Tra are you related to Travis?" And I didn't know who Travis was, so uh -huh. I finally Googled it. I Googled who is who is Travis Mannion, and I read it, and I was like, "Oh." A Marine who was way better than me. <laughs> <laughs> who, no, yeah. but it's, it's crazy that, that but, he transcend. I mean, obviously the Marine yeah. Corps is, is the smaller, you know, one of the branches, but for him to transcend the Marine Corps, for people to know that name, really is truly remarkable. And whoever asked me always seemed like, are you, they always seemed like, and then they would always tell me how great he was. It was people who just happened to have known him. Um, usually it was off the end, but you could tell that they really admired him mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. every time I see the Travis Manning Foundation out somewhere, mm -hmm. I always feel like this little, I don't know, I've always been rooting for it and always <laughs> yeah, been a fan. Well, so we're related there somewhere. Yeah, you know? we, somewhere down the, there. The, the second N out when we came over from Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so like you're me losing the O. Yeah. <laughs> your brother, you know, going on the, the fact that your brother was so remarkable, there was a book written about him that, that profiled him and another gentleman. And what was that book? So my dad ended up um, writing a book called Brothers Forever. Um, Travis was killed in 2007. And then um, uh, in September of 2010, Travis's best friend and roommate at the Naval Academy, Brendan Looney, who was a Navy SEAL, uh, was killed in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And so Travis and Brendan are buried uh, next to each other in Arlington. Wow. And my dad felt that it was really important um, to share their story not just to share Travis and Brendan's story, but to share their story as a representation of what this generation of men and women who have stepped up to serve represents. Mm -hmm. Right. And he wrote that book and um, and it got great reviews and um, hit a bunch of bestseller lists and kind of worked its way, not just around the military community, but around the civilian community as well as a really a testament to you know leadership and service and so much so that it got all it's oh, it got its way to the firefighter community as well and that's where we pick up the story with tim again and, and tim how did you find this book and and where did we go from there well what happens is the my friend steve elliott and i uh steve's a former marine uh we would trade books back and forth i would read a book i'd give it to him he'd read a book so one day he came and gave me this book and he says you you should read this book it's quick side note Proof that Marines read, that we do know how to read. So there weren't a lot there. of uh -huh. there were only yeah, a few of you, exactly. but, yeah. but we can. They exist. That's so, right. <laughs> so Steve gives me the book Brothers Forever, and I was actually reading it. Um, I was jogging on the treadmill at the gym as I'm reading the book, and one of the things that Colonel Mannion had done uh, in the book was he actually talked about Travis's visit. Um, prior to his second deployment to Rescue One. And in the book, he talks about that a former Marine um, you know, gave him the tour and mm -hmm. you know, the story as it, as it goes. As I'm reading, I, I nearly fell off the treadmill wow. because I go, I remember that night. I was working. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, they're talking about me. So I call Steve and uh, I said, I'm in the book. He goes, what are you talking about? You're not in that book. I said, remember the part where they're talking about the former? He goes, holy God, it is you. Yeah. Wow. I said, I, he, and then I told my wife, and she's like, I remember you telling me about two Marines visiting you at the firehouse. Mm -hmm. um, so what ends up happening, I read the book, and I was, you know, 
to find out that uh, you know Travis and uh, Brandon had uh, you know had, had been killed, and I was like, you know, holy, you know, I, I met mm -hmm. this guy. And, yeah. Uh, so at the back of the book, it says for more information, you know, visit the Travis Mannion Foundation website. Mm -hmm. I go on the website, and I was kind of expecting. You know, I, I hear about all these different foundations, and sure. you think, oh, it's you know, they have a golf outing every year. They give a thousand bucks to some college kid, you know, kid going off to college, mm -hmm. and and that's pretty much a lot of these foundations. But then when I realized what this foundation had become, I was I was very very impressed uh, with what they had uh, done in about uh, you know not quite ten years. Mm -hmm. um, and what I did was I I hit contact us and I sent them an email. And I said, you know, to whom you know, may concern, my name is Tim Sullivan. Uh, I'm the former Marine that was working um, when Travis, uh, you know, uh, came to visit Rescue One. And I said, I'm not some nut job. <laughs> <laughs> I really am the guy. And I, I, what I did was I talked about remember what I remembered of Travis, but I talked about what I remembered of the friend that was with him. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I remember this guy. He was a helicopter pilot. And to kind of prove myself that sure. I wasn't right. this, you know, crazy loon trying to, uh, you know, give them a hard time. Right, right. And I said, look, I just want to express my condolences. I did not know until just now in, you know, to early 2015 um, that Travis had been killed. I'm expressing my condolences. So about a month goes by and I don't hear anything. So I kind of figure it's off into the netherworld. Mm -hmm. And then Colonel Mannion, uh, I received an email back from Colonel Mannion. And he says, uh, you know, dear Tim, we've always wondered who you were. Um, you know, it'd be great. Uh, you know, I'd love to sit down with you and, uh, and have a beer someday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my reaction was, well, I like beer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Natural reaction. <laughs> um, you know, I'd love to sit down and have a beer with you also. Um, and then we, we look on into it and it turns out there's a there is a golf outing every year mm -hmm. uh, yeah. for the foundation. It's around the anniversary of Travis's. Uh, death, uh, the, you know, usually the last Monday in April or so, and Steve Elliott and I decide we're gonna, you know, we'll go down and we'll play golf and we'll do donate to the cause. Mm -hmm. And when we went down to the golf outing, um, we decided, you know, we were gonna, you know, pay our respects from, and uh, not just from us, but also from the fire department. Steve and I are both members of the FDNY VFW post, um, so we came down and we actually the the fire helmet that you see there right mm -hmm. behind. Uh, uh, Ryan is uh, is is the, one of the gifts that we presented to the foundation, and wow. the 44 uh, stands for the 44 New York City firefighters uh, who were killed in active military service mm -hmm. uh, over the course of the history of the New York City Fire Department. Um, so that's what we presented to them, and ever since that day, um, the foundation uh, has uh, brought uh, myself into brought me into their their activities. I've become more involved. Um, Ryan and I have uh, become friends, um, and they, they have been nothing but gracious to me. Um, they actually explained to me that at one point, and Ryan could probably touch on this a little bit better, but um, at one point they actually came to New York to try and find me. Wow. wow. Um, before the book, before, wow. Uh, Ryan, Ryan can probably tell this. Yeah, so I was going to say, what, what, was that, what was that like? To, you knew about this gentleman, but you didn't know who he was. Yeah. So, you know, right after um, Travis was killed, um, I think it was it was probably less than a year later. My dad said, you know, I want to go up to rescue one because it had been such an impactful trip for Travis. So yeah. we went up to rescue one. We actually had a friend who was a Marine who was a firefighter, not that didn't serve at rescue one, but had some connections there. So he got us to, you know, a visit up there. We went up. I took my it was my husband, my mom, dad and my youngest daughter. And we showed up there and they were incredibly gracious, but we could tell none of them had been the firefighters that had been with Travis. Right. You know, they were like, oh, we think we remember him, you know? Yeah. But, you know, like, but it, it's still for me walking away. I was like, well, that was special just to see. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if Absolutely, you guys have ever yeah. been to Red one, but it's incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, there's just something so special about it. And so we left there with that, you know, fast forward after meeting um, and actually getting to meet uh, Tim and being like, this is the guy, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, let's re let's rewind just a second. What was it like on your end for you and your father when Tim sends that email? What was the reaction? Well, so that came into our general mailbox. And I remember our office manager was like, forwarded this to, to my dad and I. 
and she and and just like Tim thought, like they probably thought I was some wacko. Mm -hmm. She was like, "I'm not sure if this is legit," but <laughs> <laughs> and we read it, and my dad's like, "No, I mean he knows that Steve's you know a helicopter pilot. Like this this must be the guy." Mm -hmm. But in in true you know Colonel Mannion Marine Corps fashion, he kind of sat on it for a little bit, <laughs> and not how he was going to respond, and then. You know, I mean, it was instantaneous once we connected with Tim and he came to Doylestown um, right away. It wasn't I, I knew right away when he came that it wasn't like, hey, we're going to spend the day with him and that'll be it. You know, right. I yeah. knew there was going to be a friendship there that would continue on. Mm -hmm. And and it surely has. That's, That's amazing. Just a and great story to come. <laughs> it, it's like such that. a good story. And the Travis Mannion Foundation, the it's if not me, then who? And yeah. you there's so many different avenues that you've taken in that approach i know one is in small community projects and fixing the another is this year it was a trip to alaska for gold star families to mm -hmm. connect with each other and to do service projects for other people um yeah. and i there's so many different things that the foundation does can you just give a quick overview of of what sure. it is yeah so so our goal at at the foundation is to play a role in strengthening America's national character. And we truly believe that our um, men and women uh, who serve in uniform are the catalyst to make that change. And we wanna make sure that we're giving uh, men and women who take off the uniform an opportunity to continue their service right here at home. Mm -hmm. So we're doing everything from, we have over a thousand trained um, post 9-11 veterans that are out there teaching character education to our, our nation's youth. We've uh, presented character education to over 250,000 students across the country. We run our Operation Legacy Service Projects uh, twice a year, um, where we execute hundreds of service projects across the country. And, and, it, and that's what it's all about. It's one community at a time, um, making sure that we are leveraging the skills and assets of our men and women in uniform when they're coming home saying, hey, you know, they've taken off the uniform, but they are still incredible assets to your community. Um, so we wanna give them the opportunity to do that. And, um, and beyond that, we also wanna make sure that we become a catalyst for change on how we can bridge that civilian military divide. Right. So, you know, we just, we're just finishing up our 9-11 Heroes runs. These are 5K runs across the country uh, during the month of September. We still have our new, our New York one in October 7th, but we'll execute 68 runs over the course of this month and bring out about 60,000 people. And, awesome. you know, you think about this idea that Tim's son was born two weeks after September 11th. He's 17 years old now. Yeah. Like when you think about September 11th, like that's our Pearl Harbor, right? Mm -hmm. Like each and every one of us know where we were on September 11th, but we need to make sure that these young kids that are coming up uh, understand the significance of how that changed the course of our history mm -hmm. and, and the importance that that remains within our history. And, and you think about that sense of unity we had when President Bush stood on that pile of rubble and how our country was so connected at that time. And it took a terrible tragedy like that for us to get to that place. But how can we bring back that sense of unity, unity to a country that is so divisive and divided right now? Yeah. Um, and that's really, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do. Right. I mean, yeah. and, and as you mentioned, I mean, it seems like now more than ever, we need folks like you guys to, to, to bridge that gap. Maybe not necessarily just between the military and civilians, but just everyone in general. Just to, yeah. to bring us Absolutely. back together. And I mean, is that, yeah. you know, for, for the goals and, and the steps going forward for the Travis Mannion Foundation, what do you see as the, the near future holds for you guys? I think for us, we want to keep, can, um, keep growing our base. We've got over 100,000 members across the country. And these there's only a, a fraction of those that represent uh, veterans, right? Mm -hmm. we, we like to think we serve about 16,000 veterans a year. But the rest of our membership, these are just what we call inspired civilians, men and women who, who are saying like, hey, I want to get involved. I want to be part of the process. I want to do a community project, service project in my backyard. I want to be working with kids and teaching them about service and leadership. And um, we want to keep growing that. And it's just we want to we want to 
make our way into more regions and just keep getting the word out about this idea of how each and every one of us getting back to it can take those five words, if not me, then who? Mm -hmm. Those are the five words my brother spoke before leaving for a second deployment at that Philadelphia Eagles game. Uh, my husband, you know, joked about pushing him down the stairs. Yeah. Uh, they were <laughs> like and um, he said, oh, you know, if I if I kick you down the stairs, maybe you'll break your ankle and you won't have to go back. And my brother turned to my husband and said, you know what? If I don't go back, someone much less prepared is going to go in my place. If not me, then who? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, wow. So he said those five words that night, but he lived by them each and every day. So how can we take those five words and, you know, compel each and every American to have those if not me, then who moments each and every day? Yeah. That's so awesome. And where can they go to people who are listening? What, where can they go to check this out and learn more and, and participate? They can go to travismanion.org to our website. They can find us on Twitter at TMF Foundation, on Facebook, on Instagram, all our social media platforms. But go to our website, sign up, become a member, and get involved in your community. That's so great. Yeah. It really well, is a tremendous thing that's going on. And like like uh, Ryan said, Sunday, o o October 7th is the New York City 9-11 Heroes Run. Yeah. Um, I've, I've participated in the last couple um, I've also participated in the Travis and Brandon uh, marathon team. I've run the last two uh, Marine Corps marathons in Washington, D.C., representing yeah. the foundation. And I've also become one of the Character Does Matter uh, instructors um, uh, for the foundation. So it, it really is a tremendous thing that's going on. And the If Not Me, Then Who movement, uh, and I, I've said this before, is each individual has a chance, has a, at one point in their life, had that if not me then who moment right you know and it doesn't have to be um you know something profound it's at that moment at you know, and i say usually at adversity you know if not me then who i talk about on 9 11 the 343 firefighters the 23 new york city police officers 37 port authority police officers and the thousands of civilians who were trying to help each other right in those towers it was their if not me then who moment on that day yeah um you know, I've looked back, you know, through the foundation um, and I've said, you know, at what point have I had my own if not me, then who moments? And so I think this resonates with the uh, with people throughout the country and it resonates with me, it resonates and it goes to what the national character uh, and Ryan talks about when we were united on that day uh, um, you know, after 9-11, and we'd like to get back to that. And, and everything that's crazy right now in our country, I think we need to, you know, everybody needs to say, you know, at one point, if not me, then who? What mm -hmm. can I do to make this a better place? Right. And I think Ryan and the foundation are doing a tremendous job of trying to get the spread the word and get this country united again. That yeah. is a very noble, noble uh, mission. So we appreciate both of yeah. you joining us. Tim, Thank you for your service to our country, to your for your service to the, the city of New York. Ryan, thank you for working with your family to start the Travis Manion Foundation. And, and a big thank you to your brother for his sacrifice and, and all the good that he imparted on this world before he left it. So yeah, thank you very much. I'm just much. sitting here thinking what a testament to Travis and who he was as a person. That's just incredible. And, and also, quick shout out to the FDMI, who has always been such a huge supporter of the troops and mm -hmm. and vice versa but i always uh, thought that was such an incredible relationship and i feel like this story kind of epitomizes it for me i just think it's incredible so yeah, yeah. tim ryan thank you so much for joining us yeah. today keep, thank please yeah, please keep to, making a difference what well, go ahead i have to tell you one last one last thing totally off topic but mm -hmm. you know tim and i were tim and i did the today show on september 11th mm -hmm. and um you know i i leave for new york and i tell my 12 year old daughter I'm heading up to New York to do the Today Show. And she's like, I mean, she could care less. <laughs> I'm looking at my calendar. I said, oh, I've got a, I'm talking to my husband. Oh, I've got a interview with Barstool Sports. She goes, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> nice. So thanks for having us on. We really appreciate it. We're Absolutely. just up in your street cred, yeah. making you cool. <laughs> yeah. Cool with the 12-year-olds. <laughs> nice. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Help, help.